My soul sings out to the Lord. My heart exclaims the work of God, my deliverer. For God has seen the status of God's lowly servant, and rightly from this time forward all the generations will see that I was blessed. For the Great One has done magnificent things through me. and I call upon the mystery of God's name. God's mercy is for those who honor God from generation to generation. God has shown the hand of justice by scattering the proud, humbling their haughty thoughts. God has brought down the powerful from their high places and lifted up all the lowly. God has filled the hungry with God's plenty and sent away the wealthy with empty hands. God has helped God's servant, Israel, to remember God's rich mercy in accordance to the covenant made to our ancestors, to Abraham and to his children.
morning and welcome to Alamo Heights United Methodist Church. I'm Ryan. I'm one of the pastors here. I'd like to invite you to say a prayer with me that we say each of, in each of our services here in this room. Uh, this is a prayer that would have been central to Jesus' own faith. It's called the Shema. It's a prayer that he would have said several times each day uh, when he woke, when he uh, went to bed, and every time that the text was approached as well. And so we, in our discipleship to Jesus, share this uh, practice with him. If you'll please pray with me. Shema Israel, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord alone. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. Amen. Now hear these words as a call to worship from the 103rd Psalm. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and do not forget all his benefits, who forgives all your iniquity, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from shale, who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy, who satisfies you with good as long as you live, so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. The Lord works vindication and justice for those that are oppressed. He has made known his ways to Moses, his acts to the people of Israel. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. 
This is a portion of the story of God told for you, the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. This book, Percy Jackson and the Olympians, taught me how good a book can be. The book that gave me my love for biology is Who is Jane Goodall? The book that showed me courage is Legend by Mary Lou. The book that gave me the most excitement was Ray Bradbury's Fahrenheit 451. The book that gave me hope was The Host by Stephanie Meyer because it showed me that love can be found in any place. Books play an important role in the lives of our kids. In the month of December, bring your gently used or new books to the atrium for drop-off. These books will go to Project Transformation, a nonprofit organization that leads reading programs for children in underserved neighborhoods. Your books will make a difference. Thank you. As many of you probably know, there have been a lot of different efforts that we've been involved with around this church throughout the Advent season. Uh, Just a Book is still continuing. If you'd like to bring a book to donate for Project Transformation, we would love to see that support. We also still have our alternative Christmas market going, which is a table right out here in the atrium where you can make a donation to Project Transformation or Magdalena House or any of several other ministries and get a card to give to somebody uh, making a gift in their honor. We have finished a couple of our efforts as well, and so I just wanted to say thank you for those. The Christmas market that we helped support through SA Heels and the angel trees that we've done for the children in Piedras Negras for the last several years have gone really, really well once again. And so thank you all for your support for those different ministries. If you want to continue to support, like I said, uh, go out to the atrium or you can visit our websites at ahumc.org and you can find ways to support the different ministries of our church on that website. Now I would invite you to stand once again to turn to one another and greet them in the love and the peace of Christ. And for those of you that join us online, uh, you can send us a note as well. The love and peace of Christ be with you all. Good morning. Please be seated. My name is John Baker, and I'll be doing the reading this morning. We approach this fourth Sunday of Advent with confidence and love for our coming Messiah. The first chapter of Luke's gospel tells the story of Mary's confidence and love upon receiving the announcement that she would give birth to the Messiah. Mary responded to the angel Gabriel's message of the coming Christ by declaring, Here am I the servant of God. Let it be with me just as you say. Confidence and love are not the opposite of doubt and pain. They are bigger than that. Confidence includes doubt and joy includes pain. Mary's response didn't come from denying or hiding the painful or uncertain parts of her life. That kind of confidence only comes from naming doubt and absorbing pain. That kind of love includes the fullness of life, not just the parts we prefer. This Advent season, the fullness of our shared life includes hospitals that overflow with the sick and more death than we can bear to behold, divided ideologies that cause us to desperately cling to hate, follow fear, and condone dehumanization, affluent nations shopping as if there were no tomorrow while families live in gut-wrenching poverty, and war-torn countries where millions will spend Christmas amidst the ruins of their homes. 
we are invited to respond to these tender and terrible realities. In the song Mary's Arms, Sandra McCracken writes and sings the voice of Mary, the mother of Jesus. I will magnify the blessed one. He has done great things for me. Lifted up the lowly from the dust and set the captives free. The lowly and the captives cry out still. May we respond as Mary did with confidence and love. As we light these candles, let us stand together and declare these words in solidarity with all who are in need. Here we are, the servants of God. Let it be with us, just as you say. Please join us in the prayer on the slide above. Gracious and loving God, kindle in our hearts a flame of love for our neighbors, for our enemies, for our friends, for all. From our doubt and confidence to our pain and love, that we may become one. Amen.
Amen. You can have a seat. As you do, listen to this portion of the story of God as it is written in the library that we love from the first chapter of the Gospel of Luke. Mary didn't waste a minute. She got up and traveled to a town in Judah in the hill country, straight to Zechariah's house and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby in her womb leaped. She was filled with the Holy Spirit and sang out exuberantly, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the child in your womb. And why am I so blessed that the mother of my God visits me? As soon as I heard the sound of your greeting, the child in my womb leaped for joy. Blessed Mary, who believed what God said, believed every word would come true. And Mary sang, My soul magnifies the Eternal One, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior, For God has looked on my lowliness with favor. What God has done for me will never be forgotten. The God whose very name is holy, set apart from all others. Mercy and love flows from the eternal one in wave after wave on those who are in awe from generation to generation. God's arm has accomplished mighty deeds, scattering the proud in mind and heart. God has brought down the powerful from their thrones and lifted up the lowly. God has filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away empty. In remembrance of divine mercy, the eternal one helps the people of Israel according to the promises made to our ancestors, to Abraham and to his descendants forever. And Mary remained with her about three months and then returned to her home. This is the story of God told for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Involuntary musical imagery is a phenomenon that allows music to occupy our minds even after it is no longer being heard. We might be more familiar with the terms earworm or sticky music. We can probably all remember a time when we experienced involuntary musical imagery. Now, it may not have been music we wanted to embed itself within us. I would bet that there are adults in the room right now who will shudder simply at the mention of the words, baby shark. (laughs) This sticky music can be extremely annoying, the kind of music we wish we could turn off, and yet it's still there, lodged in our brains. Sometimes we choose the song, And sometimes the song seems to choose us. In his book, Musicophilia, Tales of Music and the Brain, neurologist Dr. Oliver Sacks details the very real relationship between music and our brains. Sacks points out that the brain scans of patients who are audibly listening to a song are identical to the brain scans of the same patients who are only remembering the song playing it in their head, so to speak. You catch that? Whether we're listening to our favorite song or simply replaying it in our minds, the auditory cortex, the part of the brain that processes most of the sounds we hear, lights up. I think that kind of information begs for an experiment. I hope you do as well. I mean, it is the Christmas season. After all, this is the most musical time of the year. From overplayed and annoying holiday earworms that may or may not be sung by Mariah Carey to timeless and treasured Christmas songs that may or may not be sung by Mariah Carey. This is a season when we are overwhelmed with music. So what music is overwhelming you right now? What song is buried so deep in your bones that you don't even have to hear it? Bring one to mind. Think of your favorite Christmas song. I got to be clear here. We might have had an incident at 930. Don't sing the song. Don't share your choice with anyone. Just bring the song to the front of your mind. And we're going to spend a few moments in silence singing our songs in our heads. We're not going to move our lips. We're not going to use our voices in any way. We're not even going to hum. We're only going to sing within. Have you chosen your song? Okay. Start singing. And stop. 
Were you able to sing and hear a song in your head? Isn't that fascinating? No vocal cords vibrated, no eardrums tr transmitted any sound. No one else heard what you heard. That all took place in your mind. No headphones, no speakers, no Spotify, just you. Most of us probably take this phenomenon for granted. Earworms and involuntary musical imagery are just the stuff that happens in our brains whether we want it to or not. We accept that music, even annoying music, has a way of getting inside of us and taking up residence. We know that songs attach to our memories, or maybe it's that memories attach to our songs. Whatever the case may be, music and memory become enmeshed and entangled within us. But lest we think this is all just a mental exercise, researchers have also documented the impact music has on our bodies. In his 2018 TED Talk entitled Your Brain on Music, neuroscientist Alan Harvey detailed how the simple act of singing together can even increase the level of certain hormones in the bloodstream. Both oxytocin, the hormone associated with empathy, trust, and relationship building, and cortisol, the hormone that regulates our metabolism, immune response, and ability to handle stress, are increased when we sing songs together. Dr. Harvey concluded that making music together increases our sensitivity to pain and functions as a social glue that enhances our sense of mental well-being. In Musicophilia, Oliver Sacks shares numerous case studies and stories revealing the medicinal power of music, specifically how it can animate people with Parkinson's disease who cannot otherwise move, give words to stroke patients who cannot otherwise speak, and calm and organize people who are deeply disoriented by Alzheimer's or schizophrenia. Let's hear that again. According to Sachs, music, our songs, hold the power to animate those who cannot otherwise move, to give words to those who cannot otherwise speak, and to calm and organize those who are deeply disoriented. I can't help but wonder if this is why Mary sings. In a moment that's quite literally pregnant with anticipation and joy and fear and oppression, a scandalously expectant Mary meets a surprisingly expectant Elizabeth, and the response that leaps out is a song. The Song of Mary, what is known as the Magnificat. Does the mother of the Christ sing because she knows that our shared music increases our sensitivity to pain and functions as a social glue that enhances the sense of our mental well-being? Maybe. But I can't help but consider the possibility that this song, the Magnificat, is offered to animate those who cannot otherwise move to give words to those who cannot otherwise speak, and to calm and organize those who are deeply disoriented. It would seem that Mary, or at least, at the very least, the writer of Luke's gospel, understood something about the overwhelming power of music. The opening of Luke's gospel is actually built around music. In the first two chapters, which tell the story of the birth and infancy of Jesus, there are at least three songs. Upon seeing the infant Jesus presented in the temple, a man named Simeon sings, My eyes have seen a light and glory for all people. Zechariah, the temple priest and father of John the Baptist, offers a song at the presentation of his own son, singing, By the tender mercy of God, the dawn from on high will break upon us to give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death to guide our feet in the way of peace. And then there's the music that sets the whole thing off, Mary's song. Before the presentations of John and Jesus in the temple, even before they are born, there is music. 
Mary sings, in the remembrance of divine mercy, the eternal one helps the people of Israel according to the promises made to our ancestors, to Abraham and to his descendants forever. Three songs to begin Luke's story of the Christ. Three songs that connect the births of John the Baptist and Jesus the Christ to the Israelites, to Abraham, and to the overarching story of God. And with all due respect to the songwriters, three songs that aren't all that original. Three songs that would have sounded familiar to Luke's ancient audience. Biblical scholar and theologian N.T. Wright points out that almost every word of Mary's Magnificat is a biblical quotation such as Mary would have known from childhood. Pastor and Professor Joel Green of Fuller Theological Seminary labels Mary's song a virtual collage of biblical texts. One could argue that Mary has her own earworm, that she too is processing some involuntary musical imagery. Mary's song is an echo. It's a reprise of music she had heard and learned, scriptures and stories that had been buried in her bones, like the song of Hannah. Biblical scholars note at least eight direct allusions and quotations in Mary's Magnificat that are taken from the song of Hannah found in the first book of Samuel. Rejoicing at the birth of her son Samuel, Hannah opens her song with the words, My heart exalts in the Lord. Rejoicing at the coming birth of her son Jesus, Mary opens her song with the words, My soul magnifies the Lord. Hannah sings, the bows of the mighty are broken. Mary sings, God has brought down the powerful from their thrones. Hannah sings, those who were full have hired themselves out for bread, but those who were hungry are fat with the spoil. Mary sings, God has filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away empty. Hannah sings, God raises up the poor from the dust. Mary sings, God has lifted up the lowly. It's clear that Mary's song owes much of its inspiration to the song of Hannah. But Hannah's voice is not the only melody that reverberates in Mary's music. There are other voices and other songs resonating in Mary's song. Ancient songs, songs buried in the bones of her people, songs of involuntary musical imagery, songs that had animated ancestors who could not otherwise move and given words to forebears who could not otherwise speak, music that had calmed and organized the people of God when they were completely and deeply disoriented. Music like the song of Deborah, one of the oldest passages in the Bible, which joyfully sings of a new leader who arose to be a mother to Israel. Music like the deuterocanonical book of Judith that sings of triumph over oppressors who did not fall by the hands of young men, but were foiled by the hand of a woman. Music like the songs of Miriam and her brother Moses who sing to God, by the power of your arm, your enemies will be as still as a stone. Mary echoes her Exodus ancestors singing, God's arm has accomplished mighty deeds, scattering the proud in mind and heart. Mary's Magnificat is not an isolated performance. It's not even a solo. It's a repeated chorus within an ancient symphony, one that's filled with the voices of suffering and subversion and yearning and deliverance. Mary, the woman who would be a mother to Israel, whose offspring would foil empires and still enemies with embracing arms, knew a thing or two about suffering, subversion, and yearning. She too longed for deliverance. After all, Mary, like her ancestors before her, was born into oppression her entire life, short as it had been up until this point, had been lived under the boot of Rome and the royally corrupt family of King Herod. 
Even the circumstances around her pregnancy and marriage were somewhat scandalous and isolating. Let's put it another way. What if we were to say Mary was just a small town girl living in a lonely world? Might that create some involuntary musical imagery? It should because the music and journey of her story goes on and on and on and on. Mary was a human being. She was one of us, just like you and me. She too had been wounded. She too had scars. Father Richard Rohr said, if God can choose someone as ordinary as Mary to bear the divine into the world, we better be ready to be surprised. Mary was ordinary just like us. Did you know that we can't quite settle the meaning of the name Mary? The English name Mary, like the Greek name Maria or the French name Marie, finds its origins in the Hebrew name Miriam. Miriam, that was the name of the mother of Jesus the Christ, a name passed down to her from generation to generation, a name first found in the deserts of the Exodus, the name of the sister of Moses. The transliterative journey of the name Miriam creates a bit of a mystery. There are those who attribute the name Miriam to an ancient Egyptian word meaning beloved. And there are those who attribute the name Miriam to an ancient Hebraic word meaning bitter and rebellious. So which is it? Is Mary beloved or bitter and rebellious? What if the answer is yes? What if Mary is both beloved and bitter and rebellious? What if she's the wrestling tension between all of it, beloved and bitter? I can relate to that. I certainly have bitterness and rebellion raging within me, but there's also a song buried deep within my bones that reminds me I'm beloved. And perhaps that's precisely the point. Perhaps we're supposed to relate to Mary. Perhaps the bitter and rebellious and beloved name is an invitation. Perhaps our ordinary songwriter, scandalously and surprisingly pregnant, rejoicing over the coming birth of the Christ, is a declaration that the Christ can be born amidst the ordinary, scandalous, and surprising circumstances of our lives too. You know, there are four other names in this story. Elizabeth, Zechariah, John, and Jesus. The story takes place in the home of Zechariah and Elizabeth. The name Zechariah comes from the Hebraic word for remember. And the name Elizabeth comes from the Hebraic name Elisheva, which means my God is an oath. So to be clear... This story begins with Mary entering the house of remember, my God is an oath. Once there, the two sons in utero have their encounter. John, or Yohanan in Hebrew, means graced by God. Jesus, or Yeshua in Hebrew, means to rescue and deliver. Friends, even before Mary voices the first word of her Magnificat, this story is overwhelmed with involuntary musical imagery. Every word of this story is already singing, remember. Remember that you are not alone. You dwell in the home of a God of oaths, a God that keeps promises. Remember that no matter how surprising or scandalous your circumstances may seem, you are graced by God. Remember that this God comes to rescue and deliver. Zechariah, Elisheva, Yohanan, Yeshua. 
Friends, these names are not an accident or an afterthought. They are not small historical details. These names sing out to all who follow after. These names, like the ancient and rooted rhythm of Mary's bitter and beloved Magnificat, are an invitation to take up the song. Sometimes we choose the music, and sometimes the music seems to choose us. Toward the end of Musicophilia, Dr. Oliver Sacks writes, it's clear that music can kickstart a damaged or inhibited motor system into action again. Maybe after all is said and done, that's why Mary sings. Maybe Mary sings to kickstart or animate those who cannot otherwise move because she knew what it was like to be paralyzed by fear and regret. Maybe Mary sings to give words to those who cannot otherwise speak because she recognized what it was like to be voiceless. Maybe Mary sings to calm and organize those who are deeply disoriented because she too experienced anxiety, confusion, and chaos. Or maybe Mary just couldn't help herself. Maybe she was overwhelmed. Maybe there was a song buried so deep inside her bones, a song so magnificent that she didn't even have to hear it anymore. She just knew it. There are songs like that. Songs that remember, permeating the depths of our hearts and minds, granting access to emotions that could not otherwise be expressed. Songs that name validate and honor the suffering and isolation of the bitter and beloved. Songs of solace that hold the oaths and promises of consolation, healing, and hope. Songs that remind us we're not alone. We never have been. Songs that carry the assurance of our deliverance and the calling to actively participate in the rescue of others. So here's the question. Have you chosen your song? Okay. Start singing. And this time, don't stop. something to give Brother, sister rise up Lift your weary eyes up In the name of love we offer up our broken hearts In the name of God we fight for those who hurt Jesus' way, we heal the world through sacred scars. In the name of love, in the name of love.
one announcement for you, and that is, well, actually, I have two, one and a half. The first one is that Christmas Eve services will be in here in this room this Friday at 6 p.m. We hope you'll join us for that candlelight service. Secondly, um, our beloved chair team leader might be doing something that he loves more than this right now. It may involve hunting, so he would really appreciate your help picking up the chairs and stacking them if you have two or three minutes to help us with that after the service. I invite you to receive this benediction. My brothers and sisters, as we leave this sanctuary of time and space, we are sent to the paralyzed, the voiceless, the anxious, and the hurting. May we remember the songs of our forebears, songs that are graced by a God of kept promises. May we carry the music of hope and rescue and deliverance, remembering there is no circumstance too perilous, no mistake too unredeemable, and no relationship too broken. And may we, the bitter and rebellious and beloved, sing, sharing the music of the Christ that is buried deep inside our bones. Go in peace. We wait for a story, a stillness, a candle, a light. We wait for forgiveness, a sense of direction. Thank you. We love you. Miss you. Those online, you have a great week.